Vegas. Glitter and glitz. It's where they met. Jody Arias, a waitress slash aspiring photographer, trolling for a career, crosses paths at a business convention with Travis Alexander. Travis instantly took a shine to the pretty platinum blonde who walked into his eye line. There it was, the most basic building block of a secret. Chemistry. Sexual chemistry. He leaned in very close as if he wanted to kiss me and he was licking his lips and he was staring at my lips and like he wanted to kiss me but he didn't. He licked his lips and said I wish you didn't have a boyfriend. Travis was a Mormon and Mormons aren't supposed to have sex outside marriage. As Jody and Travis's relationship blossomed, the outside world saw a G-rated courtship, but behind closed doors. I'm going to tie you to a tree and put it in your Oh my gosh. That is so debasing. I like it. <laughs> Jody even recorded their phone sex. Sorry, the pictures of it today are so hot. Secrets are about a handful of human activities, and at the very top of the list, sex. It's where we tend to keep the greatest number of secrets and the most shameful secrets. Jody and Travis were no exception. The way you know me, it sounds like it sounds like you're just 12 year old girl having her first orgasm. It's so hot. You're bad. You make me feel so dirty. You are dirty, baby. To hear his voice in the courtroom was so eerie. And then to hear what he had to say when he was talking about his fantasies, some of them very violent, uh, having the sex over the phone with her, and we hear them both climaxing. It was just um, a, it was a, a high point and a low point in the trial. Some of the jury members are looking down. They're embarrassed. You could tell they're trying not to, avoiding eye contact with anybody in the courtroom. Others are staring directly at Jody, studying her as the sex tape is playing. Meanwhile, Jody is on the stand, hair covering her entire face. You can't even see her. She uses her hair as a shield in these really embarrassing moments in court. Secrets can be murder. In this case, toxic secrets that exploded in death. On June 4th, 2008, Jody Arias killed Travis Alexander by stabbing him 29 times, slitting his throat ear to ear, and shooting him in the face. All this happened in the confines of his master bedroom and bathroom. After Jody and Travis had indulged in an afternoon of kinky sex and naked photo sessions. Was it your idea to pose for that picture, or did Travis suggest that that take place? He suggested all the poses. That's something you really wanted to do? That was not my favorite part of the day, no. I didn't want to do that. But, I mean, I didn't disagree. He wanted to get a picture of us having sex without somebody holding the camera. Would it be fair to say that he was directing you what to do and how to pose? Yes. Well, why did you pose in these positions for him? He asked me to. So how and why did sex lead to death? What are the secrets that exploded in violence? And who is ultimately responsible? I have pictures of you in Travis's bedroom with Travis. Are you sure it's me? I mean, because I was not there. It's you. He was grabbing at my clothes. He was trying to get on top of me. I don't know where the gun went at that point. It was not in my hands anymore. It got knocked out of my hands or if I dropped it, but... I broke away from him 
And as soon as I broke, the moment I broke away, that's when he threatened my life. I'd have no clear memories after that. Jody claims she was in a fog when she left Travis's house after the killing. Nevertheless, she carried with her a new set of secrets. No one knew what she had done. I don't remember bringing the gun with me, but I remember throwing it. Throwing it where? In the desert. She's barefoot. She's covered in Travis's blood. And she pulls over in the desert and starts to concoct her story, starts to cover up her tracks. She washes her hands of blood. She throws away the gun. And then she starts making phone calls, immediately coming up with this cover story that she maintains for the next month. In her desperate attempt to keep secret her starring role in Travis's extraordinarily violent killing, Jody decided she would call Travis and leave him a voicemail. I know Leslie called you, so I already talked to her, so uh, you can call her back if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, my phone died, so I wasn't getting back to anybody. Um, and what else? Oh, and I drove 100 miles in the wrong direction. Over 100 miles, thank you very much. So, yeah, remember New Mexico? <clears throat> it was a lot like that. Only you weren't here to prevent me from going into the three digits, so fun, fun. Tell you all about that later. Um, also, we were talking about, <clears throat> when we were talking about your upcoming travels my way, I was looking at the May calendar, duh, so I'm all confused. Um, but Heather and I are going to see Othello on July 1st, and we would love for you to accompany us. An invitation to see Shakespeare, a stunning testament to the lengths Jody would go to keep a damaging secret. Her lighthearted tone, a stark contrast to the blood-soaked crime scene. A friend of ours is dead in his bedroom. We, we hadn't heard from him for a while. We think he's dead. His roommate just went in there and, and said there's lots of blood. Has he been threatened by anyone recently? Yes, he has. Okay. He has a he has an ex-girlfriend that's been bothering him and and um following him and slashing tires and things like that. And do you know the ex-girlfriend's name? Her name is Jody. Jody Arias, washing the blood off her hands in the middle of the desert, was carrying perhaps the most toxic secret you can ever keep. She had just killed a man. Jody began creating an elaborate smokescreen by canoodling with another man. She headed from the crime scene in Arizona into Utah and met up with this man, Ryan Burns. Did you kiss Mr. Burns? Um, eventually we, we kissed and we were watching some like scary movie I guess and um, he was laying next to me we weren't like really touching but we were kind of laying next to each other and I just I don't know I felt I felt safe right there and I figured like if I don't kiss him at all I don't know I don't know, I guess I just wanted to seem like normal. I wanted to seem like like I was okay, like things were okay, like like I didn't just do what I just did. Welcome to our Secrets Lab. Joining me, noted psychologist Jeff Gardier and Robbie Ludwig. A uh, Dr. Jeff, yes. she goes from killing Travis Alexander mm -hmm. to canoodling in short order within hours with another guy, making out with another guy. What does that tell you about Jody Arias' mentality? Well, I think this is a young woman who does have a personality disorder. And as we see with many women with these sorts of issues, they learn to use sex as a tool. She was doing that to cover up her tracks. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, what could the symbolic significance be of her killing Travis Alexander and then going and immediately making out with this other guy, Ryan Burns? I don't know if she really felt like a person unless she was sexually engaged with another. So as mm -hmm. long as I'm sexually engaged, I exist, I matter, I'm alive. And I don't know if Jody could feel like a person unless mm -hmm. she was in that kind of relationship. If I'm found guilty, I don't have a life. I'm not guilty. I didn't hurt Travis. If I hurt Travis, if I killed Travis, I would beg for the death penalty. That was around April that you last saw him, right? Early you, April. You haven't, you haven't been back in town since then? No, I haven't at all. Um, okay, I thought I somebody had mentioned your name and you've been back in town for like a week or a couple of days. Oh, I've, I've, been, I've been thinking about going there. So yeah, I've been definitely planning on heading down there. Um, but you haven't physically been here since 
since you left? Since I moved, no, I haven't. Within hours of Travis's friends finding his decomposing body stuffed in his shower, Jody was reaching out to cops and insisting she was nowhere near the crime scene. Were you at Travis's house on Wednesday? Absolutely not. I was, I was nowhere near Mason. And then, when confronted with a bloody handprint and other undeniable evidence that she was with Travis on the day of the killing, Jody told a second whopper that two mass ninjas invaded Travis's home and she miraculously escaped. They didn't say a lot. They were white Americans, from what I could tell. They had, um, um, what do you call those things? Like, like beanies, but they cover your whole face. They didn't discuss much. They just argued. About what? About whether or not to kill me. For what reason? Because I'm a witness. A witness of what? Of him. Of Travis. Of Travis's murder. Yeah, but I didn't really witness it. Didn't see much. When Jody finally took the stand and admitted she killed Travis Alexander, that revelation came with a stunning avalanche of sexual secrets that would rivet the nation. He wanted me to um, dress up in a schoolgirl outfit with braids. We had sex in the bathtub and then again on his bed with the, the candy. He wanted to put the Tootsie Pop inside of me. He wanted me to put Pop Rocks in my mouth while he, um, well, I gave him oral sex. And did you do that? Yes. Jody described a sexually degrading relationship that crossed the line into sadomasochism. You described the, your wrist being bound by, in a, in a noose-like manner, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Do you know how many inches or feet of rope it took in order, you, in order to have your, uh, these nooses? around your hands? No, I let Travis handle that. Jody Arias and her attorneys drew on anything negative they could find in Travis Alexander's background and just threw it all in to say that he was not the person he portrayed to the public, that he had a deviant and a violent side to him. But the prosecutor countered with stunning evidence of Jody's secret sexual proclivities. This is you sending him this text message, right? Yes. And in it you say, hmm, if you're a lucky boy and you promise to give me a good, well-deserved spanking, and then you also say, maybe you could give my a too much needed too, kitty, correct? Yes. But Jody's ace was a claim that enraged Travis's family and brought them to tears. Was it Travis's darkest secret or Jody's most vicious lie against the man no longer here to defend himself? I didn't want to talk about his issues in the text messages. What do you mean his issues? His, um, his sexual attraction to children. Did you kill Travis Alexander on June 4th, 2008? Yes, I did. The simple answer is that he attacked me, and I defended myself. Travis Alexander, a successful businessman and motivational speaker, shot and stabbed to death by his lover, Jody Arias. But Jody, in a bid to spare herself the death penalty, turned the tables and tried to put the victim on trial. Jody said Travis led a secret life, a double life. Behind the smiles and these photographs, there was a whole nother reality for Jody. A reality that Travis created. Because in reality, Jody was Travis's dirty little secret. While the world saw Travis Alexander as an upstanding Mormon, Chase, an elder, in fact, in the Mormon church, Jody Arias painted him as a sexual deviant, a man who degraded her sexually over and over again. He wanted to drive up to the home. He wanted to get out of the car, have me come out of the house, give him oral sex, and he wanted to lay on my face and then get back in his car and drive away without saying a single word.
Smiling photos show Travis and Jody after he baptized her into the Mormon church. But Jody claims right after, Travis pressured her into submitting to anal sex, convincing her that the Mormon law of chastity only banned vaginal sex before marriage. You weren't to engage in premarital sex. Your takeaway of that was penile vaginal intercourse. Is that accurate? Well, I considered other forms of sex sex, but after gaining a sort of clarification from Travis and how he explained it, then I came to understand that vaginal sex was the ultimate, like, place to not go. Jody's attorney showed photos of panties and a t-shirt Jody claimed Travis made her wear that referred to Jody as Travis's property. Beneath that was a shirt um, that he had been joking about getting me for some months or weeks maybe, it was over a month. Um, and it's, Did you describe the shirt for us? Yes, it's the one that was in the picture, it said Travis Alexander's. The pink shorts, which I didn't see his name on the back at first, I just picked him up and I thought they were cute. Welcome back to our Secrets Lab. This trial really pulled back the curtain on what you might call a very common secret, kinky sex. What is sadomasochism? And why do both men and women find pleasure in it, starting with Dr. Jeff? Well, when we look at the person who is sadistic, that's the one who wants to give the pain. The masochist is the one who wants to receive it. So now you can have a perfect union if you have two consenting adults because it takes the sex to another level. This is what they need in order to get the final sexual gratification. Now, Dr. Robbie, she tried to take that S&M and the dominance and submission mm -hmm. games that they play and make the leap that that was somehow abusive. But there's a big difference. Playing these games in the bedroom, working out your kinks, as it were, it has nothing to do with being abused. Right, but if you have someone who's not healthy, it may not be fine. In an ideal sadomasochistic kind of situation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People have this feeling that they forget themselves, which is part of the pleasure. It's very cathartic. They're, they're trying on a different role that they don't get to experience in the real world, and that's part of what makes it so sexy for them. As evidence mounted that Jody was into the kinky sex and encouraged it, Jody countered with a stunning claim against Travis, a claim that infuriated the victim's family. It involved Travis and young boys. I walked in and Travis was on the bed masturbating and I got really embarrassed. Um, even though we'd been intimate like more times than I could count, it was just kind of awkward walking in on, on him like that. And um, I was headed toward the dresser but then I stopped and I was trying to think of something funny or witty to say like, uh, do you still need my help or something and um, he started grabbing at something on the bed and I realized they were papers and um, as he was grabbing the papers one one kind of went sailing off the bed and it fell in that chaotic pattern that paper falls and it, it landed face up near my feet and it was a photograph. Um, what was in the photograph? What was the photograph of? It was a picture of a little boy. Was Jody innocently unleashing the darkest secret she knew about the lover she killed in self-defense? Or was Jody lying through her teeth with a hideous story to protect the secret truth of why? The real reason she killed Travis Alexander. I grabbed the gun. I ran out of the closet. He was chasing me. I didn't mean to shoot him or anything. I didn't even think I was holding the trigger. I would be shaking in my boots right now if, if I had to answer to God for such a heinous crime. Um, but I'm very grateful that, that this is one thing that I will never have to answer to. Of all the secrets that spilled out in the Jody Arias murder trial, perhaps the most jaw-dropping involved the elaborate murder plot prosecutors say Jody devised. Just a week before Travis Alexander was killed, a burglary was reported at Jody Arias' grandparents' home where she left in Wairika, California, a thousand miles away from Travis Alexander. One of several guns, a handgun, was stolen from her grandfather, a 25 caliber handgun. So this was reported and investigated, no one's ever arrested. 
you uh, misreported a, a gun stolen. 25 auto. Just happens to be the same caliber as the weapon used to kill him. Jody is confronted with this in, in, in uh, the interrogation room, and she still denies it, and she still is, is just acting like nothing happened. And then so cheery and normal that she actually does a handstand after, uh, you know, he leaves the room. Late in the trial, the world suddenly got to see this bizarre behavior. <laughs> Jody singing and doing a handstand in the interrogation room minutes before she's arrested. But this astounding tape remained a secret from the jury. In spite of Jody's bizarre behavior, police were far more concerned with why she killed Travis Alexander, and investigators thought they knew the reason why. Jealousy. Continuing to lie is not going to help you. If you do something I didn't do, it won't help me either. Okay, let's say for a second that I did. And I say, I did it. I mean... The motive is there. The jealousy issue. But I wasn't... I wouldn't even say it was jealous. I mean, there, I'm, there may have been some jealousy there, but... Then what is I think it? What anyone, caused this? I think if, you know, if anyone, maybe Travis was jealous, but... <clears throat> Obsessed is the word that they use. That's the word I hear from everybody. Fatal attraction. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury. That On the witness stand, Jody insisted she wasn't fueled by jealousy over Travis taking another woman on vacation with him to Cancun. When you saw this picture of Marie Hall, and he says, this is going to be my future wife, are you jealous? I didn't feel jealous. And he didn't say, this is going to be my future wife. He just said, this is a girl he's interested in. Um, but when he began to talk about her, I can't say it was jealousy. It was kind of bittersweet, because I knew that I wasn't going to marry him. But I still had feelings for him, and I knew I needed to move on. Um, and I knew our relationship was unhealthy. So I still have feelings for him, but it's more like bittersweet, because I still have a desire for him to be happy, as well as me to be happy. Welcome back to our Secrets Lab. Let's talk with our experts about jealousy and rage. You know, there's an old saying, oh, if I can't have him, nobody else can. Jealousy is one of the most fundamental human emotions. Why is it at the heart of this case, Dr. Jeff? She's thinking, okay, so you're treating me like dirt, but now not only are you treating me like dirt, but now you're kicking me to the side. I'm accepting all of this because I want something from you. I'm dependent. I'm allowing you to do all these things to me because I want to be with you. And now I don't even get the payoff. And so it's about the rage. She took it for so long. I think she saw Travis as a prize. This was the man who's going to save her. She converted for him. Mm -hmm. She really felt that he was something special. So imagine thinking you're doing everything within your power to win this prize and then this prize thinks somebody else is better than you that is a real assault to the ego and I don't think that Jody could handle that and I think with her disordered mind personality disordered mind that's when the rage was just she just could not control it so even if she did kill him out of self-defense even that was overkill the fact that she just went completely off is pathological in itself because she could have left a long time ago jody used the lies to hide the secret truth of what happened between her and travis in that bathroom and bedroom but she also had another tool an astounding claim that she went into a fog and doesn't remember stabbing travis alexander 29 times the most of the day was an entire blank and little pieces have come back but not very many when i sort of came out of the fog i realized oh crap something bad had happened and i was scared to call any authority at that point 
I really don't know the answer as to why I blacked out or have memory gaps that m much of that day. Would this fog be a get out of jail free card? Or would jurors just assume Jody Arias was lying yet again? Did you lie to the detective? Yes or no? Yes. And did you lie to him on two occasions? More than two, yes. Did you lie to people in Utah? Yes, everyone. Did you kill Travis Alexander on June 4th, 2008? Yes, I did. Why? Um, the simple answer is that he attacked me. A stunning admission, disturbing revelations, fiery confrontations in court. How is it that you are not remembering what you're saying? Because you're making my brain scramble. I'm again making your brain scramble. So in this particular case, the problem is not you. It's the questions being posed by the prosecutor, right? No, not yes the questions. No. Yes or no? I was saying no when you interrupted me. And then finally, the last words. Those are the truest words that are spoken in this case. And they're spoken by Mr. Alexander, even though he is not here, through his writing. You, Jody Arias, are the worst thing that ever happened to you. Any doubt that that's the truth? Do we need to look at the pictures of his gashed throat? Do we need to look at the sort of frog-like state that she left him in, all crumbled up in that shower? Or do we need to look at his face where she put that bullet in his right temple to know that what he says there is true? You are the worst thing that ever happened to me. He's telling her enough is enough. And yes, he's angry absolutely angry after everything that she has done to him and you've seen the manipulation as she has tried to manipulate you with what she has told you although she tells you that well he kind of was the person that pushed her in this relationship and that he was the individual that somehow was this person who was so sexually interested in her and oh by the way she wasn't that it's not her fault that any of this happened of course none of it is her fault never occurred to her that in the lexicon of the English language, there's a word, it's called no, that you can use when you don't want to do something. And yet you can then take the witness stand, however, and say, well, I do know that word, but just chose not to use it. But it's not her fault. Again, it's not her fault. It's Mr. Alexander's fault for being interested in her, don't you see? Can't you all see, based on those days and days that she was on that witness said that it isn't her fault? Not her fault. That's exactly what Jody's defense attorney, Kirk Nermy, wanted to show to the jury in his final effort to save her. You may fear how your verdict will be received by those who love Travis Alexander, by those who love Jody Arias, or by the world at large. Each and every one of you are here because all the parties involved believe that you are the type of people that would have the courage of your convictions to stand by your personal belief against whatever pressures you may feel. Each one of you is entitled to deliver your verdict to this courtroom. You do not have to succumb to the pressure of a fellow juror who may not agree with you. You can have the courage of your conviction to deliver your own verdict. Couldn't it also be that after everything, everything they went through in that relationship, that she threw him down again, that she did grab for the gun to defend herself, that after that, she simply snapped. She may not know it, but she may very well have snapped out of control, sudden heat of passion. We have been through so much and look what happened now. If Miss Arias is guilty of any crime at all, it is the crime of manslaughter and nothing more. And then maybe the most astonishing admission of all. It's not even about whether or not you like Jody Arias. 
Nine days out of ten, I don't like Jody Arias. Objection. But that. Are you, is it Sustained. That's the best. Yes, please. <coughs> Directed to disregard the last statement. But that doesn't matter. Your liking her or not liking her does not objectively assess the evidence. But for Prosecutor Juan Martinez, in the end, there was nothing but evidence, a mountain of it, and it all pointed to one person, Jody Arias. Goes down, he collapses there. She catches up to him and goes for the throat. And if you want to believe her that she doesn't remember anything, doesn't know anything that's going on, why then? Why then, if she really doesn't know what's going on and can't remember, why is she so directed at a place where she can certainly cause death? If she really didn't know what was going on, if it was just really passion, if it was just a heat of passion, then you wouldn't have a directed hit to somewhere that's going to kill. You would have dispersed all over the place. But when he goes down, there is a direct strike to his neck, which is an indication of somebody who is thinking, this person's not going to live. He may get away from me in the shower. He may get away from me all the way to the sink. And he may stumble his way down that hallway. But you know, I caught him. What does she do? She deletes only certain images. It's not like all of the images are deleted. This shows somebody who is thinking, oh, I don't want to delete the one of this dog uh, or this other one. I'll delete this, the only ones that hurt me. And that is directed behavior by somebody who claims to have dissociative amnesia. Dissociative amnesia, you heard what the definition of that was. Or is it a fog? Even the San Franciscan fog if, if, if such a thing existed, wouldn't be so cloudy to account for this kind of behavior. Jody's famous fog. Jody killed Travis Alexander, and now she found herself fighting for her own life. How would the jury decide? Ladies and gentlemen, I understand you have reached a verdict. I'm here with some members of the sheriff uh, response team and look they're dressed to the nines prepared for anything and uh, right on the other side is the cell that is the same size and layout as the cell that Jody Arias is in right now and you see it sort of decorated with the kind of things that um, uh, a prisoner would have magazines and um, their little knickknacks uh, things they hold on to but nothing that they can use to hurt themselves or others for nearly five years, Jody Arias called this Phoenix jail cell home. Justice for Travis! Justice for Travis! And after five months of lurid and graphic testimony about sex and lies and killing, the jury convicted Jody Arias of the premeditated murder of Travis Alexander. And that same jury would quickly deem his murder to be excessively cruel which made Jody Arias eligible for death by lethal injection. Travis's sister and brother made heart-wrenching and passionate pleas for the jury to end their pain by giving Jody the ultimate punishment. I cannot sleep alone in the dark anymore. I've had dreams of my brother all curled up in the shower, thrown in there, left to rot for days. All of them. I don't want these nightmares anymore. I don't want to have to see my brother's murderer anymore. Our lives will never be the same. We can never get him back. We are so grateful for our wonderful brother and we feel so lucky and blessed for the time we had with Travis, however short-lived. 
We would give anything to have him back. Anything. And that's the reason that these... And the prosecutor told the jury they had no other true option than to send Jody to death row. All of these items that have been presented to you, every single one of them, is nothing more than the defendant's statement attempting, attempting to gain sympathy. And in view of the fact that there are no mitigating circumstances in this case, the only appropriate sentence based on what the jury instructions tell you that you should do is death. And with that, the defense team made their final plea to spare Jody's life. But the only person who spoke up for Jody was Jody. This is the worst mistake of my life. It's the worst thing I've ever done. It's the worst thing I ever could have seen myself doing. In fact, I couldn't have seen myself doing it. To this day, I can hardly believe I was capable of such violence. But I know that I was. And for that, I'm going to be sorry for the rest of my life. Probably longer. I'd like to implement a recycling program. I'd like to start a book club or a reading group. My hair was past my waist, and I donated it to Locks of Love, the nonprofit which creates wigs for cancer patients who've lost their hair. Additionally, I've designed a t-shirt. This is the t-shirt. Um, which 100% of the proceeds go to support nonprofit organizations which also assist other victims of domestic violence. A survivor shirt for victims of abuse? Was that one final attempt to ruin Travis Alexander's reputation? Jody's other main argument was, spare me for my family's sake. As I stand here now, I can't in good conscience ask you to sentence me to death because of them. Asking for death is tantamount to suicide. Either way, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. It'll either be shortened or not. If it's shortened, the people who will hurt the most are my family. I'm asking you, please, please don't do that to them. I've already hurt them so badly, along with so many other people. And the final words the jury heard from either side? We are asking you to find that Jody's life is worth saving. And to have the ability to understand that despite her very worst deed, you can still show mercy and find that she still has value in her life and sentence her to a term of life in prison. The only thing that you can do based on the mitigating circumstances and their lack of is to return a verdict of death. Thank you words and then Jody's life was in the hands of the jury but the trial was far from over I have received your note indicating that you are unable to come to a unanimous decision at this time please go back to the jury room and continue deliberating you are excused and with that the jury went back to deliberate one final time but what happened next nobody could have expected we, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled action upon our oaths, unanimous, unanimously find, having considered all of the facts and circumstances, that the defendant should be sentenced. No unanimous, no, no unanimous agreement. Signed for a person. A hung jury. For Jody Arias, no final answers. And for the Alexanders, more frustration and anguish to endure. At this stage, we still don't know if Jody will pay the ultimate price for slaughtering Travis. Leaving some to wonder, is justice delayed, justice denied? I'm Jane Velez Mitchell. Good night.